Hey everybody, Robert Dunn, ArtTop10.com, and here we are today at the Barbican, about to go into the Alice Neal Press View, and that's the gallery over there. You can only do five seconds of filming on the actual pictures, so it will be quite brief what you see of the pictures, but I'll try and do a bit of a longer chit-chat about the whole thing as we go around. All right, let's go and see what happens. Okay, so here's a quick glimpse of uh, what she looked like. There she is, Alice Neal. And this is the thing, it's called Hot Off the Alice Neal, Hot Off the Griddle. Here we go, Hot Off the Griddle. That's the book that you can get. Should you come here? Um, what's the big quote up here? The minute I sat in front of a canvas, I was happy because it was a world and I could do what I liked in it. Actually, that's a really good quote. I agree with that completely. Um, born 20th of January 1900. Just going to give you the highlights of this bit on the wall. Um, she discovered she had exactly what she needed to be a good artist. Hypersensitivity and the will of the devil. These can be felt in the vivid portraits that have come to define her 60-year career. Radiate with her impression of the dignity and humanity of her sitters. Working predominantly in New York, she painted figuratively uh, when it was unfashionable. It's quite cool. Uh, she chose to portray individuals who were not typically painted, including pregnant women, black intellectuals, labor leaders, neighborhood children, and queer couples retaliating against exclusionary histories. She was crowned the court patron of the underground and persisted with her quirky expressionistic style. Even though it meant that for most of her life, she lacked material comfort, let alone critical recognition. <laughs> this exhibition, the largest to date of Alice Neal in the UK, highlights her understanding of the fundamental political nature of how we look at others and what it feels to be seen. Maybe. Neglected in the last century, Neil has come to be champion in our own for the searing candor with which she looked at the world. One of the reasons I painted was to catch life as it goes by, right hot off the griddle. The vitality is taken out of real living. Intriguing. Anyway, so here we go. Oh, there's a little picture of her um, painting up there. So hot off the griddle. And we are going up here. Seems to start up here on the left. I haven't been to the Barbican Gallery for years. It is really quite a freaky, such a throwback to a different era. Um, anyway, let's get up here and see what happens. Um, and now, remember, I cannot film more than five seconds of the painting, so it will look a bit rushed. Okay, let's go in and see what happens. Oh, there's, oh I see, yeah, there's more down there. That gives you a vibe of it. That is that famous painting I've seen before. We'll go and have a look at that in a minute. More chit chat on the wall here. All my life I wanted to do a nude self portrait, but I put it off till now when people would accuse me of insanity rather than vanity. I can't quite work out if. Um... Right, so five seconds, remember? So this is one of those really famous painting you've seen everywhere. Cool picture, isn't it? Nice blue and white. It's very memorable because it's just so bizarre. Um, but striking. I wish she was 80 when she f finished her first painted self-portrait. Taking her five years and her cheeks were flushed because it was so damn hard. Perched on her favorite stripy blue chair, she assumes the role of both artist and sitter. Neither of which would typically be expected of a woman in her 80s. Biting back against the history of the female nude in which young women oppose as erotic objects. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> when painting, she felt radically free from society's expectations and constraints. She described it as a space in which she could be completely and utterly myself. For that reason, it was extremely important to me. It was more than a profession. It was even a therapy. There, I just told it as it was. I've got to agree. I mean, I completely agree with that kind of vibe of the whole thing. That is all very good. Painting should be a place of freedom. I have no idea if I'm walking on further around the exhibition or not. Oh, yeah, we are. Okay. So, man. Havana. I don't know. She grew up in a small, conservative town, Colwyn, Pennsylvania. A little by way of culture. She knew from a very young age she wanted to be an artist, but remembered her mother telling her, I don't know what you expect to do in the world, Alice, you're only a girl. <laughs> Extraordinary comment, isn't it? These, oh, so these seem to be Havana, these works. I'm going to give you a very quick glimpse through them. I'll have a quick look back in a moment at them. She went to live in Havana. She married. She 
fell in love with a Cuban artist, Carlos Enrique Gomez. Married first June 1925 and the following February went to live in Havana. She was first trip abroad. She made painting of passerby on the street, as well as an intimate portrait of Enrique. <laughs> and she had a daughter while she was there. Right, so I'll try and keep the five second rule, so we will just whip, show you some of these pictures quickly, so we're not too long on them. Oh, they're a nice painting there, actually, isn't it? Quite sort of a graceful. That's got more brushstroke vibe to it. I'm guessing that's Enrique, looking quite cool. And we'll move on around here. We'll look at that guy with this weird shadow head. Hmm, cool. Right, we will keep moving. I assume this is the direction we go on. Strolling on down here. Quite cool, that big room down there, isn't it? Looks funky when we get down there in a minute. They are striking portraits, aren't they? And quite weird. Weird striking portraits. Oh, well, look, you got more. You seem to be all female news in this room. Right, we'll have a look in a minute. Let's just see what it says, first of all. Greenwich Village. In 1930, she had a nervous breakdown, which led to several periods in psychiatric hospitals. I didn't do anything but fall apart and go to pieces. I think it's her child that died of diphtheria a month shy of her first birthday. She now seems to be in Greenwich Village. The comment here seems to be, we are powerless. I can't bear that. I hate to be powerless. So I live by myself and do all these pictures and I get an illusion of power. Okay. She moved to an apartment on New York where she painted Beatnik Community. Amid the bohemian spirit that prevailed there, drawn to raw moments of intimacy, such as her friend, the painter Ethel Ashton, sitting naked on a bed looking up at her. You can see, so these are more, right, oh, that's interesting, these paintings. I haven't seen some of them before. Right, quick five seconds around these. There we go, that was not shown for years and years. This one I've seen before somewhere. It's rather good painting though. And these ones here. With um, more little drawings. <laughs> nice. Okay, interesting. And we go. It's quite a huge exhibition, this thing. The Great Depression. So, a little glimpse of it all. Won't spend too long, obviously. Back on me. Uh, after the Wall Street crash in 1929, America was thrown into the crisis of the Great Depression. As part of the New Deal program to counter unemployment and poverty, Roosevelt launched the Public Works of Art project, which meant she was paid 26.88 a week and submit, was expected to submit a painting of 23 by 30 every six weeks. The painting was being recognised as wage earning labour. How bizarre! Many of the artists felt exhilarated to create politically conscious work. <laughs> of course, new paintings would not be accepted. Intriguing. So she focused on capturing scenes of adversity in the city. <laughs> right, I'll have another quick glimpse of these. Remember, it's only going to happen quite fast. So a few of these got like these little small ones. The watercolor is actually just as good as the big ones. Yeah. Got. I think they said this one was painted from memory. Oh, this is quite interesting with a sort of horse battening somebody. These are so different to the other pictures, not as necessarily as iconic, you wouldn't say, as the other sort of naked portraits. And I suppose she had to work within the bounds of what they did. This thing is absolutely huge, look goes on down there as well for absolutely miles there's a weird film in here in 1938 Neil met a Puerto Rican nightclub singer called Jose Negron together they moved to East Harlem known as El Barrio Spanish Harlem where they could afford a tremendous apartment with 11 windows <laughs> should go for a studio space Interesting. Well, this is a documentary film. It's a love letter to their shared home of Spanish Harlem. Cool. Nice little picture here. I like that one. 
The portraits are striking, aren't they? They seem quite, um, well, it's quite nice. It's quite, it's quite imaginative, quite different every time. They never seem to remain exactly the same vibe. There's a constant sort of feeling of change to how she's made them, which is nice. Because I do like a bit of, you know, imagination in them. <laughs> right. Spanish Harlem. Ah, oh, so we've just seen the film, so this is a similar kind of thing. I love you, Harlem. Neil wrote Nodara in the early 1940s. For the rich, deep vein of human feeling buried under your fire engines. Given her financially precarious situation as a single mother with no income, she knew all too well the hustle required to survive in the city. And she's felt these sympathetic paintings of her family and neighbours from the area. So once again we're back into the portraits, which I think are always the best bits of it, really. Um, look at these, these are quite striking, quite different as well. These sort of drawn ones. Oh man, that's a big sort of many-figured melange. This is what I would call more like one of the classics. Loosely, quite loosely and lightly painted, which is quite nice. They're not overworked. Um, that's quite a cool one. All those figures are wonderful. <laughs> Sorry to rush past them. Um, oh, you can see down there with another film. Interesting exhibition. It's a good exhibition space, actually. I haven't been here for such a long time. It's quite fascinating to see what it's like. And you can see, that's when we came in down there. We're strolling back over here. Interesting, what's this one? This is anarchic humanism in here. I'm not against abstraction. Do you know what I'm against? Saying that man himself has no importance. <laughs> Interesting. So, throughout the 40s and 50s, we're in anarchic humanism. Well, as I think I just said. In the 40s and 50s, she painted people she admired for their political commitments. <laughs> From the Marxist filmmaker Sam Brody, who became a partner and father of her son Harley, to the communist intellectual Harold Cruz. During an age in which abstraction dominated modern American art, her very decision to paint people's political, as she explained in The Daily Worker, human beings have been steadily marked down in value, despised, rejected, and degraded. <laughs> Intriguing. I don't think all paintings are abstract in their different ways, so I don't think it really changes you. But it's interesting she wanted to, um, it's interesting what she said. I suppose if you were fighting in a predominantly abstract art world, you might feel like that. She lived with a poster of the Russian revolutionary Vladimir Lenin on her kitchen wall until the end of her life. And when asked about her politics, she replied, I'm an anarchic humanist. Right, quick glimpse of these paintings. They are good, these portraits are always good, aren't they? Look at that, looking into the distance with the giant eyes. They are kind of distorted, the figures, I think, in a way. Like him as well. They're distorted to sort of capture them. It's not like she's quite capturing real life. She's capturing a kind of version of it. It's not quite real. But it's sort of, I don't know, extra emotive and powerful. Lovely jacket on that guy. Interesting. Oh, this one's good as well. Well, I like the brown on one side and grey on the other. Because all this at the left and right of the paintings had different sort of emotional contexts. Right, on we go. Now we are now. I think we're gonna, this is, must be about the end of this top floor. Oh. Alright, there's nothing else in the... Uh, nothing else to explain this section so I assume these are still portraits of like political um, people these are weird, these ones like this, this little one here with these sort of riots going on below death of Mother Blue, I don't know who she is I suppose that's quite a political thing, look at this, this is great it's a bit Van Goghy with that mad yellow in the background isn't it kind of cool <laughs> Look at that, it's sort of vibrant. It's interesting, some of them are very worked, like this head is very worked, carefully painted. Some of the others are much looserly done. Like this, this feels looser, lighter. I much prefer this painting, it's a lot better than the other one. I quite like it when they're not about 
necessarily about famous well-known people. I think it makes it more exciting when they're just normal people. Right, now I'm pretty sure I've done the top floor, so let's roam back down to the rest of the exhibition. Alright, so we're in this downstairs bit now. I'll give you a little mini glimpse, just so you get a vibe of it. This must be this room and two big rooms down, down here. I'm a collector of souls. I paint my time using the people as evidence. In 1958, Neil began to see a therapist for the first time. I encouraged her to be more ambitious with her work. As she reflected, if it hadn't been for the psychologist, my work would have never have gotten before the world. Contrary, there's something of the pack right about me. Contrary, I yeah, said. So then she approached a poet and got him to sit for her. Interesting. She wrote an artist statement where she declared her commitment to the human creature, much like we said before. All right, let's have a little look in these things. All right. Well, she set up an easel in the middle of her living room and invited a motley collection of people to come sit for her from a local taxi driver to the so-called King of Pop, Andy Warhol. <laughs> her work began to glow with a newfound confidence as she lures sit it into metaphorically and often literally laying themselves bare. <laughs> Interesting. All right, let's see who we got here. Frank O'Hara. Maybe it was like the poet she got to come. Yeah, that's a good poetry, actually. Look, it's gone a bit more crazy now. It's actually better now. It's gone a bit more crazy. Another little film giving a vibe. This one's good. So who have we got down here? We've got Abdul Rahman. Ah, oh, Mother and Child. That's actually rather nice. Nice and lightly painted. Jared Mang oh, Mangala. He was in the, um, I think it was like the dance of the Velvet Underground. I might not explain exactly what it was, but it's actually quite a cool picture, that one. Um, we'll come back around over this side. It's interesting, that one. Interesting to see how she would have started it, just with the lines there. Black Draft D. The Family. That's good. Look at the eyes on that woman in the corner. Really funky. <coughs> Oh, it's quite dramatic as well, isn't it? With... That is... Ruth Nude. They're getting looser, lighter, more crazy, but much more watchable. It's much nicer to see them. They're really being painted. Actually becoming quite nicely painterly down here in this lower section. <laughs> Interesting. Painterly vibes, actually quite cool. Quite like that. I do like a bit of actual painting, and you have got that here. The other one's upstairs, much more kind of stilted, I would say. But down here, <coughs> it's a bit more looser. <coughs> Wild. Okay. All right, so I think this is still much the same thing. We're not doing anything different. We're still having the people. Uh, oh, look at these two. That's cool painting. Look. It's loosely painted, but it's got a real dramaticism. Actually, it reminds me of some of those David Hockney pictures you see, but of um, portraits of people. Look at these two, check them out. Yeah, it's really quite striking, aren't they, these things? Look at that beautiful green sofa. Colours are wonderful. Now look at that, that's quite striking as well, just the blue look on it. That's a really good painting. Man, that's really frightening. Crazy child and the mother. These are really good, actually. Look at that, like the people are different sizes and they're just sort of painted in quite nicely and quickly. And it, you know what, it doesn't feel laboured. I can't bear it when these things are laboured. I don't realise how many people have nicked stuff off her. So you get a definite feel that David Hockney's nicked ideas off her. Ooh, look at those two, man. Really cool. Yeah, look at that. Look, you see he's got a giant head and tiny legs. They managed to really shift around what seems to be like the actual shapes of the people. Quite sort of mind-blowing and disturbing in a way. Look at these two. Look at the beard guy. They always seem to have smaller legs. And that's got a real Lucian Freud kind of vibe to it, hasn't it? Maybe he was looking at her as well. Oh, this is a cool painting. That's more like Paula Rego. Look at that. The violet chair. That's really good colours, actually. That Really good colours. That's a stunning painting. Oh, and this is really frightening. The giant weird sort of head. 
And that's interesting, that sweet little baby. Very friendly face. Look at that one, that's got a bit of a Cezanne vibe to it, I'd say, with those greens in the background. Who is that? That I think is going to be... Yeah, Andy Warhol. You can see where he was shot. Interesting picture of Andy Warhol. She always does the top half bigger and the lower half smaller, which is quite intriguing. Right, well, we've had a bit of a vibe in here, and um, this is definitely the best room so far. You got a real vibe off it. Um, let's see what's over here. Right, I'm not sure if this is interviewer. What is the most reckless thing you do, Alice Neal? My paintings. Gus Hall. These seem to be. I'm not sure if the exhibition goes on or if this is just the last couple of things. Oh, great face on him. Quite thicker painted on that one. <laughs> nice colour in the shadow in the background. That is any sprinkle. Oh yes, yeah, so they're just saying she was a lifelong commitment right at the end of her life. She was determined to look with sensitive and humour at the range of human subjects with the courage to come and sit for her. How oh, this room brings together two of her most striking late portraits which reflects her lifelong commitment to paint candidly a community sorry, I'm missing my face who shared a desire for fairer society with greater sexual freedom now, Gus Hall was the chairman of the Communist Party and then she painted the performance artist and sex activist Annie Sprinkle <laughs> interesting oh, she painted every day really cool Right, oh, there we go. So that was... Uh, all right, and then uh, out here, there's a little kind of film. Probably just more about it. Oh, Alice on Alice, I guess. This is her discussing her pictures. Anyway. Didn't know a lot about Alice Neal. I had seen a lot of those pictures in the past. But, um, yeah, very interesting, actually. Definitely worth coming to see. Uh, particularly like the later pictures, where you got more of a painterly vibe going on. And it's a bit more... Um, Lisa and nicer like that. Uh, it's really good, interesting exhibition. Quite striking. It remains in your, you know, all these people like the crazy Jared Mangley. You get a real vibe of what he was like. But um, yeah, as they get looser, I think it gets better and better and better as it goes along. And the people are definitely the best things. This one, I like this painting here. It's just kind of wild and loose and nicely painted but you know not labored i do like them when they're not labored basically the more you look at the exhibition more it does seem to become apparent that literally i'd say lucian freud and all these people were taking ideas off her painting these very sort of i mean that and david hockney i'd say that's got a real david hockney vibe to some of his pictures and obviously like i said before that's got a this one over here has got a real lucian freud vibe to it but it, it's interesting she must have um quite heavily inspired these people um yeah but as a review of the exhibition i think it's very interesting you come back and find all these things that you know were there that inspired all those other artists. The exhibition's very interesting. I could do more light through the ceiling. More light coming down would be nice, but because it makes it quite intense without the light. Maybe that's better, maybe that's worse. Um, but it, it's, it's a very interesting show. And there is real nice painting. I definitely, definitely prefer these last rooms at the bottom. They're so much better when she really gets into that sort of loose, flowing, painted vibe. It's dramatically um, more satisfying down here. Um, even like, you know, like I said before, I've just got a real nice loose painted thing. Yeah, so as a review, I think it, it is a very good exhibition. What would you give it? I don't know, eight and a half out of ten? don't normally give points. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting. It certainly changes my view of her and it does make you think she's quite pinpoint within her greater art history that you didn't necessarily know about, which is, you know, a good thing for an exhibition. Um, yeah, I would definitely come and see it. It's interesting. Almost, you just spend more time on these lower, lower floors, which are really interesting. Just really nicely painted down here. I mean, I do like, I still particularly like 
I think that painting back there in the other one that was the sort of dark blue chair, um, the violet chair, and this one here is just painted really nicely, kind of quick and fresh. It keeps them quite fresh. Some of the other portraits a bit more heavy. Anyway, so, really interesting. You should definitely come and see it. Um, here at the Barbican, which I've been to for absolutely years. So, as ever, please like and subscribe to this thisart.ten.com for more films about art exhibitions, often in London, and um, more interviews with artists, and to my other channel, Travel Dog, for films on food and travel. Um, so, as ever, Avi Dzein, Varvitz, bye-bye, ciao, see you soon, bye-bye.